Um, my name is Leah Gilliam. I'm the VP of Education and Innovation at Girls Who Code. It's great to be here today, and AWS has been a great partner of Girls Who Code. Um, f first, just as, as panelists, we wanted to get a, a sense of who's in the room. So we'll do a quick uh, call and response. You can just raise your hand. You don't have to make any noise. Um, so just get a sense of people who are here, who are working in, in technical roles. Quick, awesome. <coughs> Uh, people who are here from HR, talent acquisition, anyone working specifically with diversity inclusion. <laughs> awesome, great. Um, what about uh, small, small companies? Less than 50 people, lean, 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 great. Larger organizations, awesome. Nonprofit sector, public policy, what do we got? What do we got? Great. Um, People who came from, uh, from abroad, anyone from outside the US. Awesome, great, great. I'm sure I forgot some things, sorry about that. Um, so our goal here today is to touch upon three kind of distinct moments of importance when we talk about uh, this idea of diversifying tech, to, to look specifically at the idea of nurturing and sort of uh, uh, creating talent and, and thinking about that sort of moment of, of the tech talent pipeline, uh, and then to specifically talk about uh, kind of cultural, culture and climate upon reaching uh, a, a job, and then also to really kind of think about the present, the present state, kind of talk about any strategies, techniques, um, outcomes we, we might want to highlight that we're, that we're seeing, and then take a quick moment to do a little bit of kind of future casting, like what do we see coming next, or just to give, out, to give a kind of a call to action. What can you do when you go back to your, to your workspace uh, on, uh, on, on Monday? So um, we'll start out just by kind of highlighting where we're, who we are and where we're from. We've got a great panel today, Netflix, Salesforce, University of Maryland, and, and AWS. Um, I'm really happy that Girls Who Code is here and sort of can talk about this, um, this area. So I'll, I'll just start off. My, my area is uh, innovation and education. Uh, I come to this work as a designer and as an artist. At Girls Who Code, we really believe that every girl has a capability to become a computer scientist. Our goal is to give girls the capability, the self-confidence, um, to really be a force of change in the world, whether they do that through, you know, going into a company, whether they do that, um, you know, uh, through a role in, in another kind of role that's maybe non-technical in the world, we think that really strong computational thinking is the key part. So we are really engaged as an educational intervention at that key moment at the beginning of the pipeline. So um, I'll turn it over to the other panelists to begin to introduce themselves. Why don't we circle this way? Tony Profit. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm Tony Profit, and uh, I have the honor of being uh, Salesforce's first Chief Equality Officer. And uh, I'd just like to remark on uh, the turnout this morning. You know, I'm, I'm really just super, super pleased and thrilled to see all you here. And this is an amazing conference, and there's so many, so much great content. Um, but the idea that, that you all chose to be here, and this was your, your first priority for this slot, you know, it really says something. It's a great testimony. I was impressed, you know, when you, uh, Leah asked for the show of hands, and you were asking for the, uh, the uh, entrepreneurs and small companies. The number of small companies that are here that have this high on their priority list, I mean, that's, that's, that's super, super impressive. You know, one of the great things about Salesforce is the, the notion that from its inception, Salesforce, the founders, uh, Mark, Mark Benioff and Parker Harris, they, 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 they believed that Business can be a platform for social good. And one of the core principles at the founding was the one, one, one model and contributing 1% of the time, 1% of the equity, 1% of the product to, to nonprofits uh, around the world. And that's you know, grown with time and actually helped the company to flourish. And so equality is really one of the core values for the, of the company along with trust and growth and innovation. And for us at Salesforce, equality, our, our, our quest for equality is to strive for a workforce that represents the communities where we operate. And that everyone who comes to work feels like they are seen, they're heard, they're valued, they can bring their authentic self, their, their whole self to work. So an, an, an inclusive workforce. And it's really driven on four key principles in terms of equality. Equal opportunity, equal pay, equal advancement, and equal rights. And being an advocate for equal rights, not just in the workplace, in a workplace that's free from discrimination, but also being an advocate for equal rights in, in the communities where we operate, in the customers and partners that, that we serve. 
So, you know, thrilled by your interest and participation here and uh, honored to be part of this panel. Good morning. My name is Allison Robinson. I'm Associate Vice President and Deputy CIO of the University of Maryland. And I am really pleased as well that you've joined us today because this is really, really something I care passionately about. At a university in the division of IT, I have a role to make sure that we are um, a diverse organization and literally I have a role on the diversity officer as well. But as a university, that's our greater calling. Um, not only computer science, you know, STEM in general, we, we need to work on the pipeline and having a diversity in our pipeline. Our computer science department itself is, is a very large computer science department. There's 2,200 undergraduate students in the department, and right now, 17% of those undergraduate students are women. Now, that represents some really big climbs in the percentages of women in our programs, but we need to see more. And um, I just did a letter of recommendation for one of my staff's um, children who are applying for admissions, and the date of birth for that child was 98. It just, I'm like, wow, <laughs> it blew me away. And, and seeing 18-year-olds come into the university, I remember when they looked young, now their parents look young. But the, it's a very, very different group of students that we have coming through the university, and some really exciting times coming, and I really want to make sure I'm supporting and enabling what they can do. Uh, I'm Devika, and I lead the messaging engineering team at Netflix. So if any of you have received any um, push notifications or emails about Orange is the New Black Season 4 or this new show called Stranger Things, we are sending those to you. Um, so um, I've been with Netflix for four years, and I've kind of seen um, a huge sort of transformation and evolution of how we're thinking about diversity and inclusion. Um, and I think what's really fantastic about Netflix is that the culture of freedom and responsibility has truly been embraced by all the people who are passionate about inclusion and passionate about diversity. Um, and um, I see people taking the lead, taking the initiative across all parts of the spectrum um, of um, the, the inclusion, uh, starting from the pipeline, moving into hiring, as well as inclusion. Uh, and it's just been great to see that. Um, and I'm going to talk some more about that with you guys later today. It's great to have everybody here. Thank you for joining us. So good almost afternoon to everyone. So I'm Teresa. Um, I am the Vice President of Worldwide Public Sector at Amazon Web Services. I've been here almost six years. And I love Stranger Things. Wow. It's like so, ooh, uh, pins and needles with it. Um, and. We, we care deeply about diversity. And in fact, I'm, I'm really, um, we're all really excited across the business because Andy Jassy really cares about this. Jeff Bezos really cares about this. And we have a big initiative where we're really diving deep and trying to figure out what things can we do better? How do we take care of the diversity candidates that we already have and how do we bring more into the business and why don't they stay? And how, I mean, we're asking ourselves all these really hard questions so we can improve. And that's the way we do things at Amazon. We dive really deep into an issue. And when we focus on it, we solve it. And so um, now, we, we're not going to be able to do this alone. That's the reason we power tech. We've got to do this jointly. Uh, so everybody has to have a focus. But we are very focused. And I'll just say we have a whole group of individuals internal to Amazon and AWS doing some things. My focus, uh, while I deeply care about internal, my focus tends to be a little bit more external because I'm in the field a lot and I'm, and I'm doing things to support um, young girls, which is a big passionate area for me to get young girls uh, excited about careers in technology. I love to see their faces light up and I, I love to see uh, to get them to think differently about their career. And then I also spend time on the public policy side, uh, trying to get both countries and educational groups to, to really change the way they're thinking about curriculum when it comes to computer science and technology. So that's, so I spend my time, I, internally is really important, but I, my bigger and greater focus for me is on the external side of the business. Great, thanks. <laughs> 
So um, let's let's start off. We'll talk about. We'll first talk a little bit about the kind of nurturing, the identifying, the hiring um, of talent. Devika, I'm going to ask you to sort of start and talk a little bit about um, your experience and 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 um, maybe some of the cultural assumptions that you overcame uh, sure. as you as you entered tech. Yeah. So um, I grew up in India, in New Delhi, um, and um, the norm there for um, for women uh, was to be homemakers, right? So it wasn't that women were professionals or in tech. Um, and if I were to draw my family tree, most of the women uh, would be homemakers. Now, fortunately, the women I was closest to, my mom and my aunts, were um, entrepreneurs and they were running their own businesses. And I saw them making decisions. I saw them uh, kind of living a great life, being very self-sufficient. Um, and I really loved that and that resonated with me. Uh, and fortunately, uh, computer science had just entered New Delhi at that time, and it was the big hot thing. Um, so, you know, for the people who were in professionals, uh, it was mostly about being engineers or uh, mechanical engineers or doctors or lawyers. Computer science was a cool, new, shiny toy. And I think that helped me because it was, it was very cool. Uh, my school teachers were very supportive of that. And so through my personal um, sort of inspiration uh, with the women in my family that I was closest to, and through this um, really awesome uh, glorification of computer science, I think that really made it fun for me to continue doing that. I was part of the computer club um, in school, and uh, that just kind of kept me going, and that became my, um, my focus area for, for school. Um, so what kind of, I think, was really important is that, that initial uh, kind of um, the ideation, the initial inspiration uh, stays with you for a long time and it's really critical that we get that right. And so for Netflix, um, we started an initiative last year. Um, we are calling it Netflix Back to School. Uh, and essentially we brought girls from high school to come in and, and hear from women at Netflix. And so we had women from the different teams come and talk about what they, what they do a day in their life at Netflix. And when they left, they felt super excited and energized about just tech. And we're fortunate that Netflix is part of the pop culture and that creates that, that coolness factor and we can really showcase how great it is to, to be part of this revolution. And so we're gonna bring that back again this year. I'm partnering with my colleague um, and it's, it was truly like a grassroots effort that started out and we're gonna continue and build that further. So I think that's really important. That's great, thanks. Um, Girls We Code just did some research with Accenture and we particularly looked at that moment of how girls sort of their interests get sparked and one of the things that we really saw is that that kind of initial moment if girls don't have role models or if um, they're not kind of if they don't feel encouraged that they can kind of get turned off to math, science, technology um, from there on in. So we know how important that, that initial moment is. Allison, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of once, once the spark has been lit um, and, and a girl or a young woman or you know, someone from a historically underrepresented group gets to college, what are some of the strategies you're seeing? What are some of the tactics that you, you're using at University of Maryland to keep people engaged? I had a very uh, a co a great conversation with the uh, director, Jan Pla Plain, of uh, the Maryland Center for Women in Computing, and they actually um, impact at various ages in, in students' lives. So there's, there's different strategies that they have to be able to spark interest, but that's not enough. You need to sustain it. So much to what you were saying, they work it's neat what they do because they offer these programs to engage, um, they're, they're, it's women in computing, but they support um, any underrepresented area in, in, compute, in computer science. So there's student groups that form around ethnic minorities, for example, and they support them as well. So what they do is they offer different programs, but then they conduct research on their own programs to see what are, what are they impacting when you have a one day versus they offer a camp that happens every summer for three years for, for students. And what are the impacts of these choices um, so that research can really help define those things. They're working right now on advanced placement courses in the high school and studying what's the difference between a high school that has computer classes versus one that has a, a, an aggressive computer curriculum that's an AP course. And the outcomes from that are, are incredible. They've built resources um, for helping you. If you here are interested for your child, for your business, their website 
right there shows you the information that you can have and who to contact, and it's free and it's available for you to use wherever you are to be able to build these programs. So it's really important to have that outreach and to substantiate these things through the schools. And then once, once in college, too, a lot of support programs around the uh, students that are there. They've got a really neat program called the Ambassador Program where undergraduate students become ambassadors and go out to the community and will do these, um, these students, undergraduate students, will do two hour presentations to different Girl Scout groups or whatever has contracted with them to come and show these robotics. And at University of Maryland is, is we're, we're in a really neat location. We're eight miles from the Capitol. So one of the um, biggest hiring, hi, people that hire our graduate students from computer science is NASA. And um, there's, there's a video, a Big Ten video on, on the Maryland Center for Women in Compute, and there's a 16-year-old talking about her internship with NASA. So there's really great opportunity for students in the area at various levels of K-12 and, and the university. Thanks, that's great. I'm gonna turn it to Tony and Teresa, and can we talk a little bit about the role of the corporation in this work? Because I think, obviously, it's not just about education when it comes to hiring and, and preparation. Um, it's, a complicated, uh, it's a complicated situation. So what's the role? Surely, and uh, you know, any conversation like this, you know, I always go into it you know, uh, with two principles in mind. Uh, the, the first is, you know, when you talk about you know, successes, it's like successes, you have to do the air quotes because you know, I think we all have to acknowledge that the technology industry you know, has, has a long way to go in terms of uh, diversity and inclusion, and that's why we're all here, and that's why this is just a super important conversation uh, re you know, really to, uh, to, to, uh, to engage in. Um, you know, you think about some of the things that, that we're working on, and we're working on things that will have a short-term, a mid-term, and a long-term impact. But any time that you frame a conversation, you talk about pipeline, um, I think you have to resist the temptation to say, well, it's a pipeline issue. And therefore, there's not an imperative, there's not a sense of urgency mm -hmm. that we've got to do something like now in the, in the, in the immediate term, in the short term, and in the midterm to make an impact. But I'm gonna talk about some of the things that I'm excited about that do span you know, all, the, the, all those focal lengths, but, but with all that in mind that there's an urgency that we have at Salesforce and there's clearly an urgency you know, across the industry. So we have a, a, a array of partners and it spans all the way from like kindergarten and pre-K, you know, all the way up through through college and, 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 and post-college. And so some of the partners that we're working with are uh, at the, that work at the earliest ages are uh, you know, code.org. And that's, uh, if you haven't done it, you know, the hour code's coming up. We partner, many, many tech companies partner with code.org. This is a phenomenal way to get young people involved in, they don't have to, have to be able to read yet. And you can, and it's in, done in a way that's it's super engaging with characters that they that they love, Disney characters, Star Wars, Legos, those sorts of things that they, uh, Minecraft, that they love and get them, using something that, that's magnetic to them, those characters, in a way to do very, very simple programming and start to get those seeds, plant those seeds of computational thinking. There's many, many programs, great programs out there, Girls Who Code, Black Girls Code, Code 2040, um, many, many great places that we are, we're partnered with that we think are doing uh, wonderful things. Um, now, one of the focus, uh, uh, foci for, for Salesforce is a focus on K-12 education. And you think about it, you know, around the world, you know, education is that lever, it's that thing that levels the playing field and opens the doors of opportunities for, you know, anyone, young, young women, people of color, um, anyone economically disadvantaged, and everyone from the majority, you know, to provide great economic opportunities. So we've made a, a deliberate focus and doubled down on K-12 education, and we started the closest to home, and we've partnered with the San Francisco Unified School District and the Oakland Unified School District, contributing both resources and as well as time of our employees on a multi-year basis to make a difference to drive STEM-based education for young young people in the communities where we work and where we operate, you know, late, later on in, in, the, in the pipeline, we're also working on internship programs. There's a great program uh, called Year Up uh, that we're partnered with. Uh, Genesis Works is another one. Sparks is another one to provide opportunities for people who don't have a four-year computer science degree from a great institution, and uh, but but still are brilliant minds, and that with with training and an opportunity and some work experience, you know, in a in a in a technology company, they become great great employees. So these are you know deep partnerships that we have, and then in college recruiting, opening the aperture of the schools that we look at, uh, going beyond the, the typical schools, and then going to places where there's deep deep pockets of talent. You know, one of the great examples is uh, Grace Hopper. You know, I just had the opportunity, the, the honor, to go there this year. And, and who had a ch chance to go to Grace Hopper this year? Anyone in the room? Okay, and well, if you didn't, I, I okay, right here, look, I, yeah, I, I highly recommend it. It was my first time, 
you know, this year and is going to be a regular. And it's, you know, more than 10,000, um, largely young women focused on computer science, a convergence of great minds and great talent. And if you're trying to recruit, you know, and, and try to increase the gender diversity of your team, I mean, this, this is the place to go. And it was uh, really uh, mind expanding to go there. So those are some of the range of things from the longer focal length to the, the immediate term that we're working on to, to bend the curve. Thanks, that's, that's terrific. Okay, yeah, it's on. I want to apologize to everybody on this side. I know it's hard to see us. I apologize to you guys. Um, so that w I so agree. You got to have short term, mid term, and long term goals, and you you got to be in it for the long haul, and you've got to definitely have a long term view of this. But I agree, the immediate need is here, so we've got to make sure we're focusing on the the here and now. And we absolutely feel like we have a responsibility toward this uh, at AWS at Amazon. Some of the things that we're doing, I'll talk a little bit more on the external side, but um, you know, we're still sort of a fairly young company at AWS. We're 10 years old this year, and we got going and we got moving really fast. And then sometimes you have to sort of step back and take a pause and say, "Whoa, wait a minute! We need to be, we need to make sure that we have a focus on this too. You know, an intentional focus." mechanisms of things that we can really do. So we're getting a lot better on that. But, you know, some of the things that, that we've also been trying to do, when I go around the world, I try to spend time with senior female leaders. And every city I go to, I always ask my team, find the top women in this community. And we have lunches, cocktail receptions, dinners, and my partners actually help sponsor them. And we actually bring women together and talk about the needs in their own community. Because the big thing for, for us in our business is when we walk away, we've got to make sure that there's others carrying this torch, kind of. It can't just be us again. There's got to be others carrying the torch. And what always sort of blows my mind, believe it or not, we talk a lot about this in the U.S., but if you get outside the U.S., this is not always a topic that's discussed. And in fact, I did a session uh, in Colombia uh, with with a group of senior women and we came together and they said they had never been brought together ever before to have a discussion and I was like really we do this all the time in the US <laughs> you know so it's really mind-blowing so around the world it's very different wherever you go so that's one where we are also working um, with many of the groups same girls who code code.org um, I, I find every technology company I can, like Code Combat is one of my new favorite tools for teaching coding. Like we try to support and do this. I have education as part of my portfolio at Amazon Web Services. So we partner with the schools. We're partnering with like our publishers and ed tech programs to really uh, push out more content. One of the things we launched over a, year, a little bit over a year ago is something called AWS Educate. And with AWS Educate, we're actually providing uh, tools and resources to computer science uh, instructors around the world and students. And with that, we're having a focus on diversity. Margie, raise your hand. We just hired Margie, which took me a while. Margie has a background in diversity from Columbia University, and we hired her on to really just focus on that, again, more externally to try to drive programs. So it'll be her job to create a business for us to really just help us do more of these like programmatic efforts. But on the AWS Educate side, we're trying to take that out to specific programs like creating uh, coding clubs for girls on campuses and schools schools, reaching out to parent-teacher organizations in different ways. Because for us, we believe we want to teach a DevOps model for coding. I mean, we actually believe there's a new path. And just a very, very quick story. There's a group that we sponsor in Belgium, and some of you may have heard this story before. I love this. It's a girls' coding club in Brussels. And they actually got the girls to come by telling them they were going to create fashion. And when they brought them, their age is like nine through 16. And when they got them there, they taught them to code, but they created fashion through coding. And it is awesome. These girls are just like all about it. And their fashion is everywhere that they've created. But now they're doing other things, but they were trying to just, because they didn't have a lot of programs there, and they were just trying to get do an outreach to get the girls to come in and actually do coding. And I just love that idea. They got super creative. But there's many other things, but really the career pathways for us with AWS Educate is just a way we want to 
reach out and have diversity within uh, different badging that we're going to do that we hope will appeal uh, to young girls and women. And by the way, students have changed. <laughs> students are now 24 to 40 versus uh, the original 18 to 24. So that's even changing. This, this is a fabulous panel. So, we, so we're, we've already bounced around and gotten about five call to actions, I'd say, about sort of small things that we can do, um, large things that we can do, uh, how we can use our individual time to work with other organizations. So this is really fantastic, and it's great to hear what everyone's um, up to. I'm, I'm always curious just how familiar people are with some of the literature around this. Have people seen some of the literature around diverse teams and how diverse teams function? Just curious. Terrific. What, what about the, the Jane Margolis, Alan Fisher book, Unlocking the Clubhouse, which particularly looks at the role of the issues of women in computing? PDF, available online. Google it. Download it, please. It's really great, really important uh, text. What about some of the, the research that's really specifically about kind of diverse perspectives and personalities and the productivity of diverse teams? OK, great. Great. So um, we're gonna, we've already sort of made this transition to sort of talk about what kind of happens in the workplace. As Tony has said, this is such a complicated issue. Um, we could spend a long time talking about any of, these, any of these issues, but we just sort of wanted to get some kind of tactics, some strategies that people are working. Feel free, to, feel free to also share things that didn't work. I think that's always really helpful and instructive as well. Um, so back to the, to the panel and to just think a little bit about what are some of the things that you've been um, working on and doing within your, within, within your companies. I'll, Devika, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, so, like I mentioned, um, you know, the Netflix um, efforts have been very, very organic and grassroots, and it's truly freedom and responsibility coming to shine. Um, and um, I think it all started about four years ago when a few of us decided that we wanted to get together and have a women in tech event. Um, we wanted to really um, create a, a fantastic environment to make all the women feel awesome and included. And what better way to do that than showcase what we'd been working on. And so uh, that was our first Women in Cloud event. Um, and since we had just made the transition to AWS, uh, we had some great topics to talk about. Uh, and we just, it was like about five of us who got together, worked through the agenda, worked through the different sessions, invited speakers from outside, got the invites going, and it was a great event. And uh, it really created this community of uh, women, and it was very empowering. Uh, and so that was the start of it. And then uh, we have, uh, we, that started the Women in Tech Google group, the Women at Netflix Google group. Uh, we also have um, other minority groups uh, in Netflix as well. Uh, and what's great is that people take turns. It's not like you know one person is doing it all the time. Anybody will go up and start a conversation. We have great conversations, very candid discussions on this Google group about um, how women should really be thinking about careers, what's working, what's not working, what's the glass ceiling. And it's, it's very nice to kind of have a home for these conversations. It's, it's no longer taboo to talk about it. And I think that's been the, the greatest transformation. Uh, and also, we have happy hours to Teresa's point. Um, anybody will take turns. We have a happy hour every quarter. We'll just get to see what other women are doing, who they are, like what do they do, how can we learn from them, right? Uh, share things, share experiences with each other. Uh, and sometimes we do more structured um, quarterly meetings where we brought in speakers to help with presentation skills or marketing skills. Some of the things that women sometimes aren't great at. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of stereotyping, but you know we're known to be great at building stuff, but not really talking about stuff. And so uh, being able to do that more in, in a great environment uh, and share that has been really, really powerful. Um, and I think moving forward, um, we're going to be doing more of these events, uh, more conversations. Uh, and it's just been very organic. And it's fantastic to see everybody kind of who's passionate about it take the lead. It's not just me taking the lead or uh, another director taking the lead or a VP taking the lead. It's everybody who is passionate about it can do something about it and can really contribute towards all aspects, towards all parts of the spectrum. That's great. Allison, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the curriculum and efforts you've been working on at University of Maryland? So the, the, a lot of what um, I would add about the curriculum I had stated about what the Maryland Center for Women in Computing are doing. Mm -hmm. And um, interestingly, though, the inclusion and diversity in the university is, is very important. From, from President and Provost on down, we um, just engaged in the Gallup uh, 
work, um, work engagement survey. And um, one of the things that we have for the university is a chief diversity officer. And Kumea has each, each division and unit has a, um, each college and division has a diversity officer. And that's the role I have within the university for the division of IT. And it is actually where um, it becomes accountability to the areas to be diverse. Each unit also has an equity officer. And we partner to um, work together to bring, have a more diverse um, environment for our work. So I, have done some work around looking to see how can we write position descriptions to make them more approachable for a, to attract a diverser pool of candidates. Um, the equity officer helps me implement that in the hiring practice because that's what their 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 role is is to facilitate hiring. Um, Diversity officers yearly have to come up with goals for one to three year out for the goals for the division. And we are measured back to being able to do that, um, a data-driven approach to diversity efforts. And so we've set those goals up. For example, last year, we knew we were going to have this engagement survey. So we wanted a, I think I set it at 75 or 80, I shot high, 80% um, participation rate in filling out the survey within the division. And then we just really worked towards doing that because we need that baseline of data to understand where we can make a difference. So we've, we've really done this through our, our HR hiring practices. We are a big proponent of student employees. We have a lot of brilliant students. Excuse me. So what we do is um, train them and bring them in and create a pathway for them as a student employee. And we hope to bring them into the organization after as employees as well. So that really helps us start building our own pipeline as well. Now, a lot of you out there grab them on us. But what they need to do is what we want them to do. So we're, we're excited when they, they go to work for all of you in, in their careers. Thanks. That's great. Tony to the rescue there. OK, I'll talk about a couple things um, that uh, really proud of at Salesforce. And these weren't things that we did alone, uh, but um, they, they had a real impact. Um, the, the first is taking a stand for LGBTQ rights in, in, in this nation, but particularly in Indiana. Right. So start there. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, wasn't, I was not with the company. I was not with the company when, when that happened. And, um, but I can tell you from outside the company, as in the tech industry, I, I was so proud and literally, literally, literally brought to tears when I saw the actions that Salesforce, and particularly uh, Mark Benioff took, was to stand for the rights of LGBTQ, LGBTQ people in Indiana, Indiana, then in Georgia, and then also in North Carolina, right? And so, and that, you think about it, the synergistic effect, the ripple effect of how that's empowering for, for, for anyone of any gender, anyone of any race, that when you're willing to take a stand for the rights of for LGBTQ community, that that says something to, to all communities. So that's something I'm super proud of, and I think uh, the synergistic effect is not to be understated, the impact it has of having that North Star in the culture that you're willing to take a stand for your values. The second is around equal pay and the action that the company took around the equal pay audit, and uh, without really knowing the cost of it, but saying we were going to audit worldwide the, 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 the pay based on gender and f fix any disparity. And you know, had to you know, you invest three three million. Thank you. Thank you. In, invest invest three million dollars to to make it right. And so you know, taking those principled stands, I think, um, are, are 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 great benchmarks and compass points that people can look at to say, well, what does the company really stand for? So those are those are two in terms of really transforming the culture while you're also trying to make the company you know more diverse. That's terrific. You want to jump in there? No. I mean, well, I'll just say, look, the women at AWS are amazing, and we have we're now we we have a lot more diversity groups now, which I love, just around the world, which is and we're encouraging that. But the women are doing. We have uh, women, our women in engineering group at Amazon. We have our women at AWS. Then they're all doing sort of unique and amazing things. We have our leader over here of HR who is focused with us constantly in helping drive an agenda and mechanisms around things that we can be doing better. And she's helping championing that with Andy, which is really good, who's driving us. And we want, you've got to have leadership. All this starts at the top because you can have grassroots, but you've also got to have a leader that really believes in this and knows that it has to happen. But we have, um, you know, we have groups 
on a monthly basis and around, again, around the globe, I'm constantly getting notes and photos from our women who are running events out in the schools, locally with each other, and just sharing ideas in new ways. And, you know, for the first time, like two, I guess it was either two or three years ago, again, we're a fairly young org. We had our first um, cocktail reception for all the women who worked at AWS that were in sales, sales and marketing. And it was awesome. They loved it. And now we have this annual event. We bring them together. We have speakers. And that we get questions that are really great questions like, how do you have confidence in doing certain things? Because I think it's really important to also just address the daily needs that the women face within their jobs. Because there's still a lot of questions like, how do you balance life? How do you when you get a seat at the table, how do you actually take that seat at the table? There's just a lot of things that have to be addressed. And I think we're really trying to do that head on through mentoring programs and just, you know, answering the hard questions that need to be both asked and addressed. That's great. Well, we're, we'll take a moment to kind of give some, some final takes here from our panel. We want to leave enough uh, time for you guys to to give us your questions. Um, I think one thing that's important always that I try to talk about in this context very specifically is this idea of mentorship and sponsorship. You know, for me, particularly as a creative person who, who taught myself to code before I went to school um, to sort of learn how to do it the, the, a, a more efficient way, let's say. Um, uh, some of my, you know, some of the most important sponsors and mentors in my life were white men. I think it's really important to understand this idea of allyship. So what does it mean to encourage other people to not just hold open the door or help them kind of crash the, the, the ceiling, but invite them to the table and really, and really sort of show up. So um, I always like to throw that out there just to make sure people understand and remember that this is a really complex issue. I think all of you who are sitting here today obviously um, know that. Uh, we wanted to leave some time for you guys, but I thought maybe just to kind of wrap up a little bit, we could kind of put out either um, a call to action. We've certainly have heard a lot already here today, just a request um, to kind of get out there and think about partnership. Think about, you know, the geographical location where your company is, you know, where your family is, how you can actually kind of make, do a, take a small step in, in making this not just sort of a big issue that you read about in the, in, um, headlines, hopefully, going forward, um, but also just something that you have a, you have an individual role in or, or a part in as, as well. So maybe call to action, kind of future casting, anything you want to highlight or think about um, that's important uh, for others to be thinking about in, on this issue. Yeah, I'd say the, the call to action I'd offer to everyone in the room is to get involved. Even just take that first small step, right? Just do, do your homework, pick one cause, Pick one NGO, pick one public school you know, nearby where you work or live, and invest one hour, one hour a month. So who, who here is willing to do that? Wow. Okay, there you have it. Okay. What I would offer is just with your favorite search engine, start taking a look. When I talked about position descriptions and how you can change language to make it more approachable for more people to apply, readily available. Many university human resources will come up in your search. Universities are all about pre, um, free access to information and they'll share this broadly. I mentioned our, our Center for Computing offers curriculum. They're more than willing um, at your universities and, and local educational institutions to provide resources to you if you don't have them yourself. But look inward as well. Oftentimes, there is someone in a company that has this role or responsibility. And in my experience has been when you find them, they're really willing to help you. So look and see what's available. Do something, not nothing. Yeah, I'd, I'd say um, that one-on-one -on -one conversation is really important. So um, you all meet uh, people and women around you or um, you know, people looking for inspiration and for some stories. Share your stories with them. Um, you know, talk about what was great for you in technology and inspire people and that make that, make that um, really special for them and create that, uh, that excitement and joy for technology um, to, to propel them forward. I think that would be, that's the easiest thing to do, right? Just have a conversation, you know, don't have to go very far. I'll, I'll give you a couple. So one, how many of you are uh, male managers in the room? Raise your hand if you're managers. Okay. 
So if you are a male manager, the one thing to do, if you have females on your team, I bet there's a lot less females on your team there than that there are males. Make sure that you intentionally ask them to do things, that you intentionally give them responsibility, and that you call them, call upon them to answer questions in meetings. You give them an opportunity because it's one of the things I've really noticed is a lot of times the women will not speak up. And so give them an opportunity, give them a role. Um, I loved your mentoring. I was the same with me. I got into tech and a CEO of a company gave, I had no background and he saw something in me I didn't see in myself. So look around and make sure you're asking uh, the females to step up to something. So this is much more internally, but ask them to take on things that you wouldn't have maybe even thought, give them an opportunity, let them stretch themselves. You may be really surprised um, so create that, create that diversity within your own small team. Very important. Secondly, again, on the outside, when you're doing interviews, um, make sure again, as a mechanism, be really hard line about this. Don't even take an interview loop until you have diversity in that loop. I mean, just that's something simple you can do. Say, we're not even going to do this loop till I have more diversity in it. And then thirdly, even further out, Find something, a school, an individual that you can mentor, a school, a classroom. Just take on something you can individually do. Make it about you and what your capacity is and just say, I'm going to do something. It may, everybody has their limits and everybody, some people don't from to, to infinity and beyond, right? So just whatever's right for you, figure that out and do that thing. Quickly add some uh, a few uh, really great examples I've seen at Netflix of uh, male leaders really taking an initiative here. So uh, we have the manager of the Android team who uh, organized with the, this uh, with this girl group of girls called the Bay Area Girl Geek Geek Girls who code, uh, and he actually set up that whole event, uh, coordinated with them, was a liaison, and, and really championed. Uh, this initiative. Uh, our VP of streaming, um, Anthony Park, uh, was very instrumental in going to the Grace Hopper conference and meeting women there, talking to them. Uh, our chief product officer, Neil Hunt, was uh, has always been the spokesperson at the events that we have at Netflix to really make a big difference and to really talk about um, how important diversity is. And so I've seen some really great uh, leaders um, talk about diversity and uh, and really make it a great uh, conversation. So um, I've just been super excited about that. Thanks so much. So we're going to transition into some Q&A. Can I steal a microphone? Thanks, Leah. And I'll also make one quick announcement while we're uh, gearing up for Q&A. We have a, a row of girls from Girls Who Code. Can you ladies please stand up uh, right here who have joined us? <laughs> These are the winners of the Summer Immersion Program uh, from Boston and from Seattle. And they actually have demos that they're going to be showing out in the hallway at the end of the hall. So please go see them on your way out as you grab lunch. Um, that's one action item number one. Action item number two, um, in Galileo 902, write this down, Galileo 902, today from one to five, we're going to continue the diversity discussion. So we have some tables there. Uh, I'll be there. Uh, we'll also start capturing some of these stories. So we'll have a videographer there. And if you're willing and interested, we want to hear from you. As Teresa mentioned, we're starting We Power Tech. We want to hear your stories, all right? So come Galileo 902 from 1 to 5. You all have a story to share, OK? So join me there. Thank you. All right, who has the first question? Uh, Leah, uh, well, first of all, let me say um, I'm very proud uh, to work for a company like Salesforce, and, and thank you, Tony, for all of your efforts um, to diversify uh, Salesforce and and, um, and the tech community more broadly, and that, that last part goes for all of you. Um, Leah talked a little bit about mentorship um, and, um, and allyship, um, and as a white man, uh, as, a, as a straight white man, um, I would like to contribute to, to make my fellow employees feel welcome. Um, I'm not a, a manager. I'm not responsible for hiring people. But 
what can I do um, to make the women on my team, to make um, the people of color on my team, um, to make the LGBTQ um, individuals on my team um, feel more welcome without sounding condescending or, or um, yeah, without, without condescending to them? Yeah, that's, a, that's such a great question. I mean, I think also, you know, as people in tech, we, we, are, we, we, we can be slightly introverted. This is very uncomfortable. Um, I think the, the key thing is like, this is also, this is about, about making someone your friend, essentially. It just, it, try to get to know them in a way that feels authentic. Um, it's just as hard uh, with, whether it's someone who looks exactly like you or if it's someone who's completely, who's completely different. But particularly as someone com coming new you know, to a company, I used to work at, at Mozilla, we were completely distributed. When we were actually physically in the same place, it was just an awkward convention. Um, so I think part of it is just to, is, is to, is to sit with that discomfort a little bit and reach out to, and reach out to people. It doesn't have to be creepy. You know, it, can, it can be authentic and just be like a, a natural thing, coffee, you know, slack someone, see how, see how they're, see how they're doing, anything you can, you can help them with. Talk about a movie that they like. I mean, <laughs> it's the best icebreaker. Hey, what do you watch? Like, or, you know, just try and find some common ground. Did, yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, yeah I, I would add that the number one inclusive behavior, and this is um, something that um, the study show is one of the things that, that drives the high performing teams. Is, is, is the discourse in meetings. If you did one thing, this is not just a thing for, for white males or males, or it's for everyone. Stop interrupting people. Mm. Stop interrupting people in meetings. Right. Someone. And I'm, I can say, I'm, I'm, we're all guilty. So I'm guilty, guilty, I do it. You know? And that's the one thing. So when, when someone who is hesitant to get their voice out there, and then, then they, they take that chance and someone interrupts them, right? That's so, it's so not empowering. Right? Or if you have a meeting and at the end of the meeting someone hasn't spoken, you know they've got great thoughts, make sure there's a forum or a venue for that person to say, hey, what are you thinking? Those two things being included in meetings, that's where 90% of work happens and the rest of it is more casual and social and you have to be more inclusive in those things. But that's a huge and powerful thing that we can do is just make sure people's voices are heard right? and that they really feel valued and we're really listening and we're not waiting to interrupt them or waiting to argue with whatever point they're making. You can help support. I don't know if y'all saw the uh, article in the Washington Post about the women who were part of the Obama administration, yeah. where they, it was great, and I know a lot of those women, and they're amazing and high-powered, but they were being left out of meetings, literally left out. They had been part of, of getting President Obama elected. They were high, But then when they got into the White House, they were being left out of meetings, not invited, and they noticed it. They're like, what the heck? Um, and they got together as a group of women and talked about what they could do. And they decided they came up with something, it's called amplification, and I love it. And you don't, it doesn't have to be for just women, but the concept is they, they got together and they talked about their ideas. Well, they pushed themselves into the meeting, so more power to them on that. They got into the meeting, they just showed up. But when they showed up, they noticed they still weren't being heard. They were being talked over and around. And so then they went back and they said, okay, now what we're going to do, we're going to go in together and we're going to have these three things that we want to get across in this meeting. And each one of them would take one. And then if somebody tried to interrupt them or they would stop them and say, you know, Valerie, I really like what you just said. Can you talk about that more? Excuse me. She's talking. So they used uh, their own power of jointness to solve that problem. And I think you can do that. I love this concept of amplification. And I always tell everybody, the meeting sometimes is not the meeting, it's the meeting before the meeting. So just always remember that, the preparation, the understanding of how you're gonna do it. And even you can help do that, like just amplify them, help support them in these kind of environments. We have time for another question. Yes. Okay. Hi, panel. Hi, Hi everyone. Hi. Uh, my name is Lakeisha Grant, and I'm the owner of Virtual EA. And um, to add another level or layer to this discussion, um, our company has had great success in hiring veterans, and um, specifically service disabled veterans, um, anyone who's served who, of course, they, they have issues in transitioning. 
And so my question specifically to Salesforce, because I know AWS, we partner with you guys on um, Hire Our Heroes. So I know you guys are advocates of um, internships and programs uh, for veterans. Um, we're also an employer as well in the program. But specifically for Salesforce and Netflix in particular, I really wanted to see if you guys have any initiatives um, specifically for for veterans, because we I, I'm a military spouse, and like I said, majority of my folks are are veterans, so that could be something that is of interest. And, and all of you guys who are here who are also hiring and developing your pipelines, if you're not already you know, considering veterans, please do so. That's a great point, and I think that really um, supports that, what someone said earlier, just pick, you know, pick an issue, pick up, pick something that you really care passionately about. Thanks. I say, no, that's a, that's a super important issue, and it's one that's close to my heart. Uh, my, my father served this great country for 20 years. And he served this country in Korea, and he served this country in Vietnam. And so I, I was born in Fort, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. So it's one that's close to my heart. At Salesforce, um, you know, we, you, people talk about employee resource groups, and we call them Ohana groups. Ohana is the word we use to define our culture, and it means family in Hawaiian. So we have an Ohana group called Vet Force, and it's so, solely focused on empowering the vets there, welcoming vets, having outreach to the to the veteran community, and uh, finding ways to recruit and, you know, of course, retain and advance the veterans at Salesforce. Certainly, more that we can do. It's a top, but it's a top priority for us. Yes. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Lakeisha. That's a great question. Yeah, so uh, we recently had a, um, a lunch event for Veterans Day, and we brought together people who had families who had served, and it was a great sort of way to honor them. And uh, I think that just got the conversation started about um, just getting to know who's there and what they're doing and build a support system. I think it's a good starting point. Um, I, nothing formal yet has come of it, but I appreciate that. We will definitely take a look at that. Alina, did you want to add something? Yeah, yeah. We do partner with several um, veterans hiring organizations. We've done a few events with them. Um, one thing we found has been really amazing for Netflix's culture. Netflix has a culture of freedom and responsibility. And veterans who are out in the field needing to make really important snap decisions in the moment has been really, really um, a, just a really strong fit for our culture. And so we found that that has just been a really great connection between the culture that's promoted in the mil military um, and the culture that we promote here. So we've definitely had some, some really great success with that and we'll continue to invest there. Can I just say too, if you're gonna hire veterans, you gotta do it the right way too. You gotta make sure that you have the right training, that they are a special, amazing class of individuals. And you just gotta make sure when you take on veterans, you've gotta do it in the right way and really support and get the training they need. Uh, it's it's important. On that note, thank you everyone for joining us. It was a pleasure to be a part of this conversation today. Thank you guys. I agree. Thank you. We power tech. <laughs>